Welcome to Pathway Church Online. My name is Jared Piney. I'm the online pastor here at Pathway, and I'm here with one of our worship directors and online host, Maddie Sykes. Hi there. Here at Pathway, we are one church in many locations, including here online. During the service, you'll experience teaching from a member of our teaching team, as well as high energy worship. Absolutely, and we believe that you are here for a reason. It doesn't matter if you're watching on our website, our app, or social media, God has a purpose for you and has plans for your life. If this is your first time watching, I wanna say welcome. I wanna encourage everyone to fill out a connection card so we can get in touch and pray for any prayer requests that you have. Also, if you decide to take a next step later today in service, simply visit the link on screen so that we can help provide you with resources and partner with you in this journey. Well, hey, thanks again for joining us online. Join us now as we worship together. Oh, shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down When I hear that trumpet sound Oh 
Well, as we come to our generosity moment, we want to remind you that there are many different ways to give to God through Pathway Church. And you see, when we are generous, it grows us closer to God and allows those resources to be used to spread the hope and love of Jesus to others. The Apostle Paul tells us that God loves a person who gives cheerfully. You see, when we give cheerfully, it shows that we are putting more trust in God than we are in the security of our money. Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, Paul says this, They share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Part of being generous is looking for ways to spread the hope of Jesus to our neighbors, to our coworkers, and to our friends when they have a need. You see, we can be a light in their life and we can stand in the gap of those needs. We encourage you this week to be looking for people who God put in your path that have a need. Pray that God would give you opportunities to be generous and fill that gap with those that have a need this week. Yeah, and we can't wait to hear stories of how God used your investment to impact others. Well, get ready for a message called How to Hit a Curveball as we continue our series Swing for the Fences. This message is from our lead pastor, Todd Carter. Feel free to open up your Pathway Church app and hit the weekly guide. Then you can click on the message notes to follow along to this message. Welcome Pathway family, Goddard Valley Center, Westling. Those of you who are watching online to the second week of our series, Swing for the Fences. And swinging for the fences, if you're not aware, is actually a baseball term that describes giving all your effort in order to hit a home run, to put it over the fence. And, and our hope and our desire really through this whole series is really to give you some practical advice right out of scripture that will enable you to hit over the fence, for you to be able to have a home run family that changes the world for the person of Jesus Christ. Now, last week, uh, Pastor Elliot and his wife, Jenny, opened up their lives and talked about how we can swing for the fences in our marriages. And this week, I wanna talk about how we can swing for the fences in our parenting. And as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, and I was thinking about baseball, I couldn't help but think about my friend Andy Dirks. And if you don't know who Andy is, Andy is a hard-nosed, blue-collar kid who grew up in Haven, Kansas. He played college baseball at Hutch Juco and then went on to Wichita State. After Wichita State, he was drafted in the eighth round of the major leagues where he went on to have a great career with the Detroit Tigers. And so I called up Andy this week to talk about baseball, to talk about some of the challenges he's faced uh, in his career and his life, and in particular, to talk about some of the bad choices that he made during his growing up and young adult years that created a lot of fear and apprehension really for his parents. So check out this conversation that I had with my friend, Andy Dirks. Watch this. Well, Andy, I want to say thanks so much for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you had a lot of stuff on your, your business schedule, working with real estate, and I know you got a lot of things on your family schedule. Four kids, five and under, is that right? I was trying to remember. Yeah, I can still count them all on one hand. So, you know, that's not that many, right? Yeah, four, five and under. There's times of concern that I'm starting to learn as they grow. And uh, by the grace of God, I'll be able to parent them the way I should. Well, as I was thinking about our conversation today and I was thinking about baseball, I wanted to show you this video and get your reaction to it. I 
Lakers have him loaded for Dirks, and he looks to give his team some breathing room. The 0-2 swinging a fly ball, right field! Way back and gone! Grand slam home run for Andy Dirks! Fourth home run of the year breaks this one wide open. 7-2 Tigers in the fourth. When I watched that, I thought, man, that is as good as it gets. I mean, to me, hitting a grand slam in the major leagues. I mean, tell me, how did you feel after you hit that ball? You know, there's a lot of emotions that lead up. In baseball, what a lot of people don't realize, it's, it's relief when you do good. Because, you know, there's pressure. There's fans watching. There's a lot of people in the stands. You put a lot of pressure on yourself. Bases are loaded. I had two strikes. Your mind is trying not to go to that place of I'm, gonna, I'm about to fail and everybody's going to laugh. And you hit the ball and you're like, oh, I got it. You start running and now you go from scared and fearful that you're going to fail to I'm invincible. I'm the man. Look at me, you know. One of the other things, Andy, that really I discovered kind of about your career, even though I've known you for a long time, was that you were a Golden Glove nominee. I mean, tell me a little bit more about that and kind of about that journey. So I always took pride in defense, and that was part of my work ethic. I always shagged balls at 100%. I was always laying out and going and getting it. And obviously, when I got to the big leagues, I was, I was very good at outfield. And Alex Gordon beat me. Actually, my stats were better than his, and my range was better than Alex Gordon's that year. But Alex Gordon hit, like, 290 with, like, 20 homers, and I hit, like, 255 with, like, six. Andy, as you were growing up, you had a mom and dad who loved you deeply, really taught you uh, right from wrong, uh, clearly gave you some great um, moral boundaries in your life. But I know that when you got to college, when you, uh, in their young years of certainly your professional career, that uh, you made some choices that certainly made your mom and dad's stomachs churn. Talk to us a little bit about um, uh, kind of in terms of that rise of your career, some of the situations that it ended up uh, putting you in, choices that you made and how that in the end, uh, where that left you. So my dad was a wise man. He told me two things will ruin a great ball player, women and booze. Two things that I did not uh, go away from were women and booze. And both of those things uh, became destructive habits in my life. My problem was when I left the house, I was no longer under their rule and I didn't have a ruler above me anymore. I didn't have any reverence for God. I was, had zero fear of God. I didn't care about his commands. So I go and do what Andy wants to do, just being my own God. Little did I know I was a puppet in the hand of Satan, and he's just guiding me down a path that slowly, even though, you know, I was, I was still well-respected, still well-liked, it was slowly leading me deeper, deeper, deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper into a pit, right? Into a, a place of, 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 spiritual destruction and just death. So, you know, I would, wouldn't treat, I, I would be sharp with my wife. I would make it all about Andy, or I would always feel like, why is, why is she pushing away? Why does she not want me to have fun? Why is everybody else in the whole planet think that I'm great? And I told her that one night we're sitting there and I came home and, you know, I went and had a couple beers with some buddies at the bar, come home. And I said, everybody in the world thinks I'm great except for you. And I, when I did that, it was like God hit me in the forehead with, with a two by four. And I was like, everybody thinks I'm great except for you. You're the one who actually knows me. I mean, I, I was wearing masks. I'd be this guy for business. This guy as a dad, this guy as a, as a husband, this guy, and we'd go to church even. I'd be this guy at church in this front of these people. I'm the cool guy in front of these people. I'm the saint. Like, and that's exhausting. Oh boy, is it exhausting. And when I said that, I realized that, that she saw my true identity. And that's when it really started sinking in. I didn't like reality. I did not like living day to day in reality. I didn't like reality. I didn't like living day to day in the reality that I was in. So here we have this very capable young man whose parents have clearly taught him right from wrong. Yet Andy dove headlong into a lot of bad choices that left him in a place that he didn't want to be in. And as I was thinking about Andy's story, I couldn't help but about thinking about another story, a story from Scripture, about another kid who had everything going for him, yet dove headlong 
into a lot of bad choices. And it's the story of the prodigal son from Luke chapter 15. And so if you're a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, or an influencer of a young person today, I want you to notice here, there's going to be some great lessons in this story that I think can really teach us to swing for the fences in our families, even when the kids in our lives make bad choices. So listen today what Jesus says here in Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 11. He says here, there was a man who had two sons. Now I want to pause there just for a moment because I want you to notice something just right off the bat in the story. I want you to notice how many sons does this man have? He has two sons. And just to give you a little bit of heads up about what's going to happen in the story, if you don't know, well, one son in the story uh, takes the right path and the other son in the story takes the wrong path. And, and, and know this man who had these two sons, he raised them in the same home with the same set of values, with the same mom and dad, with the same everything. Yet one son seemingly goes the right way and the other son goes the wrong way. So, so here's, parents, what I, I want you to notice from the very beginning. Kids have minds of their own. You, you can raise your children exactly the same way, with the same rules, with the same environment, with the same everything. But they still may choose to go down the wrong path because they have minds of their own. And I know some of you are here today and you have a child that's gone down the wrong path and, and you're saying to yourself, where, where did I go wrong? Well, where did I mess this thing up? And you're thinking to yourself, maybe I should have disciplined them better. Maybe I, I should have taught them to be more responsible or maybe I should have put them in private school. And, and let me say to you today, those thoughts, those feelings, those are so real. They are so real. My own children have made bad choices that I've felt horrible feelings of failure when they've done that. But I want to say to you too, don't blame yourself for every bad decision your teenager or your adult child has ever made. They're independent human beings. Sure, we could have all done things better as a parent. Sure, we made mistakes. But just like we can't take all the credit when our kids turn out great, we also can't take all the blame and the responsibility when they make bad choices. I mean, God is ultimately the one who helps them turn out to be great, and God is the one who can bring them out of trouble when they make bad choices. All right? It's so true, and we've got to trust that. Well, let's move on in our story and uh, see what happens next in our passage uh, beginning with verse 12. It says there, the younger son, the younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, when we get to this part of the story, we really don't think too much about it because, but back in the first century, let me tell you, this was a huge deal because a son did not get his father's estate until the father is dead. So the son was in essence saying to his father, I wish you were dead. He, he was saying to his father, Dad, I'm sick and tired of your rules. I'm sick and tired of your reg regulations. Dad, I'm sick and tired of you. I'm out of here. And parents, I, I know that there are some of you here right now who've had your own children, uh, like this father in the story, say some very hurtful and painful things to you. They have in essence said to you one way or the other, they wished you were dead. But I want you to notice in our story what this father does, how he reacts. He allows his son to make his own decisions. You know, it's interesting. I can remember back when I was in about the seventh grade and I had really long hair. Now, I know it's a little bit hard for you to imagine that, but it's true. And I thought my long hair was really cool. But my mom and dad told me they didn't think it looked quite so good. But I was like, man, it's my hair. I'm going to do whatever I want. 
So they said, okay, have it your way. And I can remember going on vacation that summer with my cool looking long hair and I can remember going into a grocery store, getting a few items and then uh, trying to find a, a checkout line to get out. And this man who was in front of me, when I was in the checkout line, he steps aside and he says, this little lady can go in front of me. And I gotta tell you, when he said that, I was done. I mean, no long hair for me after that, and I've been like this ever since. Not really, but, but that's how exactly where I was at. But I had to learn that lesson on my own. And my parents, they could have told me, you're not going to have hair like that. You're, we're going to shave your heads, our house, our rules. But they didn't do that. They let me learn that lesson on my own. And we've got to allow our kids to learn some lessons on their own. Even at a very young age, we've got to start practicing that, to allow our kids to learn those lessons on their own, even at a very young age. Well, let's get back to our story and see what happens next, beginning with verse 13. It says there, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Now, a lot of times when we talk about this passage of Scripture, we talk about how bad it must have been for the son. And, and certainly that's absolutely true. But, but I want you to think for a moment how bad it must have been for this young man's parents. Knowing that their son well, was out there all alone. Knowing that he had, he had made a lot of bad choices that had left him in a whole bunch of pain. And I have to tell you from my own experience, that's excruciating. I, I know for me, when I've been there, I, I, I've just been so afraid for my kids, uh, afraid for their pain, afraid for the long-term consequences, and, and afraid of all the things that they don't see coming, see coming that's really going to hit them in the face. But notice here, the father doesn't go and rescue his son. And no, too, here, there was probably all kinds of people out there who sent this father and mother text messages about what was going on with their son. But, but the parents don't go and rescue their son. So the first lesson I think that we can learn when we get thrown a curveball in our parenting is pray and back away. Pray and back away. Did you kind of get that? Pray and back away. And I say pray and back away for two reasons. Uh, first, when, when someone ha has a child who's really struggling, the thing that I hear most of the time is we've done everything that we can do. Well, we've, be, we've been to counseling. We've, we've tried intervention. We, we've tried grounding them. We've tried taking the car away from them. The only thing left that we can do now is pray. And, and all of those things are totally right. And they are totally good. But prayer ought to be the first thing that we do. We should be praying boldly in advance and all along the way for our children to be able to be filled with God's wisdom and following him all the days of their lives. That's what we've got to get committed to. So I want to encourage you, pray all along the way with your kids, trusting God and asking him to be at work in your child's life all along that way. And then secondly, like I said, what we've got to do is be able to back away. Now, parents, we've got to get this truth bore down in our souls that God loves our children much more than we do and is a much better teacher than we are. We've got to back away and let God begin to work in their lives. God works in so many ways that we may never understand. And in so many times, what we do is we swoop in and we rescue our kids right at that moment when God is really trying to be able to do something powerful in their lives. But we can see here, the father doesn't do that. The father backs off and he lets the natural consequences take their course. And that principle, I mean, it applies to everything as we're parenting. I mean, it applies to homework. It applies to our kids being disrespectful. It applies to our kids getting in trouble at school. And it applies when our kids get in trouble with the law. And as our children get older, 
the more decisions they can make on their own and experience those direct natural consequences of those decisions. And when they do that, it will help them grow and mature. And our job, though, as parents is to teach them when they're young, so when they're teenagers and young adults, the consequences aren't so extreme. But we know at the same time, sometimes that happens. Look what happens in our story, beginning with verse 15. It says there, So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and I am here starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So we can see here, there was some pretty extreme natural consequences that happened to this young man. But do you catch what it said in verse 17? It said, but when he came to his senses. You see, this young man, he woke up in this pig pen, and he realized he didn't want to be there. And the reason that he changed wasn't because his father and mother screamed him into changing. And I, gotta, I can tell you from my own journey, I mean, that's a monstrous temptation. I've got this gravity inside of my soul that I want to scream my kids uh, in, into making the right decisions. But no. The son changed because he came to that conclusion on his own by the grace of God. And that's exactly, when I was thinking about my friend Andy, that's what happened in his life. The crisis of his own life caused him to come to a a pivotal point in, in his journey where he knew that he needed to change. So I want you to listen again to Andy's story and see what happened to Andy when he came to that pivotal point came to that point of crisis and what God did in his life as a result. Watch this. Then I know at a given point in time, Andy, there was, that, there was kind of a, some pivotal circumstances where really kind of you kind of hit some rock bottom and you really kind of came to your senses, so to speak. Talk, talk to me a little bit about kind of what happened kind of during that time frame. Literally, I sat on the couch one day and Megan and the kids were off doing something else. I started to analyze my life, you know, really open up a little bit and analyze it. And what I saw was I was a failure in a lot of things. Like, yeah, my business was doing pretty good, but my marriage was not doing good. And then as a dad, I'm like, how much time am I, do I really even love my kids? You start asking yourself these questions. They're hard questions, right? And what I found was I'm not capable of keeping everything together. It doesn't matter how hard I would push or how hard I would try. I couldn't get victory over sin. Sin, I could not get over, you know, uh, temptation. I, the, I loved sin. I could not get to where I would not be angry or bitter with my wife. I could not get in a position where I really thought that I was training my kids well. And I realized that sin was my God. It had complete control over me. Drinking, bitterness, anger, you name it. But in that moment on the couch is when I finally said, I can't do it, Jesus. I got to trust you to do it. And literally, that's all I did. I said, I'll go all in. I'll do whatever you want me to, to do, because I know if I can't do this, nobody can. And there's got to be somebody that can, and people say it's you. So let's, let's do it. I said, I'm going to jump off of this cliff, and I'm going to trust you like you would trust a parachute. I think you're the best. I think you're a parachute. If you're not, I'm going to splat flat on my face and I'm dying. But I knew if I didn't jump that there was lions behind me getting ready to devour me. If I stay where I'm at, I'm dead. There's, there's no life in this life that I'm living. I knew that. Let me jump and trust Jesus that that parachute will take me down to a nice soft valley with green grass and water and an abundance of blessing. And lo and behold, I jumped. And not only was it a parachute, it was literally like he just guided me down as I trust him and grew in him into this blessing of a valley where my marriage is blessed, my business is blessed, my kids are blessed, I'm blessed, my relationships are blessed, 
I mean, it's just, it is incredible what Jesus can do in a person's life. I mean, the testimony of the living God is watch what he'll do in a person's life. Watch what the Holy Spirit will really do. If somebody jumps off the cliff and says, God, I'll trust you. That's all he asks. You put your faith and trust in him. You jump off that cliff and go all in. I promise it will be worth everything times a billion. There is nothing that compares to walking through this world with God. Isn't that awesome? You see, Andy came to his senses. He turned to the perfect father and God transformed his life. And parents, our kids will never honor God until they come to their own senses, and until they come to their own faith in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and, and sometimes figuring that out, what they believe about Jesus and how they're going to follow him, man, it takes them down a very long, painful road. But, but pray and back away and let God work. And when he does, it is incredible. And that really leads us to the conclusion of our story. Leads us to the conclusion of our story where it says, beginning with verse 20, so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and kissed him. So the second lesson that we can learn when we get thrown a curveball in our parenting is show love from above. Show love from above. Love your children with the unconditional love of God. I mean, that's what this father really does here. He loves his son unconditionally. And I want you to think for a moment about this father and all that he'd been through in this journey. I mean, this father has been embarrassed by his son. I mean, he's been hurt by his son. Uh, he's probably even been misrepresented by his son. And then his son, I mean, he decides to come home. But do you see the father's heart here, though? The father saw him while he was still a long way off. I mean, the father is looking for him here. And then the father, he runs to his son, and he wraps his arms around him. He loves him unconditionally. He wanted him to come home regardless of what he had done. And parents, that's what our job is, to show love from above, to love our kids unconditionally, to love our kids the way Christ loved us with kind of a, a Romans 5, 8 kind of love where it says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While, while we did all kinds of hurtful, embarrassing, sinful things, Jesus demonstrated his love for us by dying for us. And, and notice uh, where, where the son, when the son comes home, the father doesn't retaliate. He doesn't say to everybody, uh, here's my loser drug addicted son who's finally come home. No, showing love from above is about redemption. It's about redemption. It's not about retaliation. The father hugs him and, and, and he takes him and, and he has, has a party for him. Listen to what it says beginning with verse 21. It says there, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Can you see what happened here? The father was just so excited. He, he couldn't contain his love. He puts a ring on his finger. He, he, he puts a robe on his back and he says, all those nights, all those nights I cried. I cried and I cried. I begged God to bring you home and now you're home again. That's all I ever wanted. You were lost and now you're found. You, you were dead, but now you're alive. Let's come together and let's celebrate together. You see, to me, that's just such an incredible uh, story, an incredible end to the story. That the father, he just handles everything so perfectly. He, he prayed, he backed away. And when he, his son come home, he showed love from above. He loved him unconditionally. And you really get that sense they went on and they lived happily ever after. And to me, that's just so awesome. That's what God wants for all of us. 
But I know today, I know today as I share this story, there are uh, many of you who have children, who have grandchildren or children that you are connected to that are still out there in a foreign land. Even though they may be at home and, and they're lost, lost emotionally, lost relationally, lost spiritually, and, and you don't know where they're going to end up. They've maybe rejected you. They may have rejected God. And it's just so scary when you find yourself in that position. But wherever your child's at today, and whatever your relationship, I just want to pray for you. Whether you're a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, an influencer of children, what I want to do right now is I just want to pray for you. And so right now, I just want to ask everyone at all of our locations, and those of you who are watching online, just to bow your head, just to close your eyes with me just for a moment. I just want us to be able to, right now, just to be able to pray together. And, and as we begin praying today, I know that there are many fears that we have about our kids and their lives, their futures, the choices that they're making and the consequences that they may be experiencing that are, that are in front of them. But I want to say to you today, give God your fears. Give God your fears. Give God your hurts. Give God your children's future. Because God understands what it's like to have children. And he knows as well what it's like to have rebellious children. He understands. He knows exactly how you feel today. And know that he cares more about your kids and about those kids in your life than you do. And God's desire is this, that we would pray, that we'd back away, and that we would show our children love from above to unconditionally love them. And so today, if you want God's help to be able to be that kind of parent, to be able to, to pray, to be able to, to back away, and to be able to love uh, your children with that love that's from above, I just want you to raise your hand right now. Raise your hand right now. If you're watching online, you can type me in the chat, but I want you to, to raise your hand right now. If you got, want God's help to be that kind of a parent, that, that'll pray, that'll back away, and that'll show love from above. Praise God. Praise God. Me too. Hands up all over right now. Praise the Lord. I'm so happy, Pathway family. We want to be a community of people, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, influencers of children that are doing that. Praise the Lord. Let me pray with us right now. Oh, Father in heaven, I just thank you so much that you are the perfect parent, that you have just parented us perfectly, God. And, and thank you so much, God. That, that you bring about your very best in our life, that you love us, that you love our children and those children that we influence so much more than we ever do. But today, God, we just ask for your help. We ask for your help that we would just be a, a people that would pray for our children, that we'd back away, and that we would love from above, that we would love them with the love that you've loved us with. God, we're just so thankful that you're so good and we just give those children and ourselves to you. Now, as we continue to pray uh, right now, I know there's others of you who have never taken that very first step to come home for the very first time, to be able to surrender your life to the person of Jesus Christ. And maybe you're thinking that you're a long way off that you need to kind of clean up your life first before that you can come home. But, but I just want to let you know today, Jesus takes you just as you are. He just wants you to be able to come home, and he wants you to be able to come home right now. And so don't miss this opportunity today. He's waiting for you. His arms are open wide. He wants you to come home. So I want to invite you, come home right now. Make Jesus Christ the leader, the savior of your life. Pray this prayer with me right now. Oh, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. 
that I've made mistakes, that I've been far away in a foreign land and I've made all kinds of choices that I'm ashamed of. But today, Jesus, I want to come home. I want to make you the leader and the savior of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. And now use my life, Jesus, to be able to go and offer your love and your hope to other people. Now, with everybody's head still bowed right now and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time and you made Jesus Christ the leader and the Savior of your life, if you came home today for the very first time, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to raise your hand real high, just a sign to God that you are all in right now and so that I can pray for you. Raise your hand real high, just wherever you're at. Wherever you're at, if you're watching online, uh, you can click that link that's in the chat right there. But raise your hand real high. Tell God that you are all in right now. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Me too. Me too. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Let me pray for you right now. Oh, Father in heaven, I just thank you so much today for my friends, my brothers and sisters who surrendered their life to you for the very first time. God, thank you so much that they came home. And Father, thank you so much that you welcome them in. You welcome them in with open arms. You wrap your arms around them. You put a ring on their finger and, and just a, 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 you kill the fatted calf and we, you just love them, God. We just thank you so much for that, God. God, we just pray your blessing on their life. We pray your goodness in their life, God. We just love you. And we just pray all these things right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Surrendering your life to Jesus is the best decision that you can make. If you made that decision today, then we are so proud that you took that step. As you think about the decision, know this. One of the most important things to know about your relationship with Jesus is that you are not alone. Whether you made a decision for Jesus recently, or maybe it was today, or maybe you haven't made one yet, I want to tell you about Starting Point. In Starting Point, you will hear about what it's like to follow Jesus, as well as understanding that you are not alone in your faith journey. One of the most important things in my faith journey has been people walking with me and helping me grow in my relationship with Jesus. I want that for you as well. If this is something that you are interested in, just go to the web link below to find out more and to register. You can join an in-person experience at one of our campuses, or you can sign up for an online experience as well, and we will get a chance to follow up with you. If you're new to Pathway Church, whether this is your first time watching, or you've been with us for the last several weeks, but we haven't had the opportunity to meet you, then remember to text the word NEW to 316-444-4180 so that we can follow up with you and welcome you to Pathway Church and we'll send you a digital gift card to Starbucks. Well, the gospel of Jesus is that God is one step away from people. And when they put their trust and faith in Jesus, then everything changes. We can use our words to share the gospel to others, and we can also use our actions to share the gospel to others. When we do these in harmony, then great things happen. I want to tell you about my friend Michael. Michael's neighbors are an older couple with limited mobility. And for the last two years, Michael has went over to their house almost weekly and mowed their lawn for them for free. This is an incredible act of service. Now, here's the thing. The couple doesn't ever say thank you or show their appreciation to him. It's kind of like they expect this from him. Personally, I think I would struggle with that a little bit. And Michael told me that this has caused some frustration, but at the end of the day, he doesn't serve them to get a thank you. He serves them because it is being obedient to God, and it's a way for him to share Jesus through his actions to other people. Now, I love that story, and I want to encourage you to share Jesus with others this week through your words and through your actions, and look for ways to invite people to Pathway Church so that they can experience the good news of Jesus Christ. 
I want to remind you to join us on Sunday, April 25th at 11.30 a.m. for the online service after party. Just go to the link on the screen below. You can save that in your web link. And next week on that Sunday, go to it to join our digital after party. Well, taking communion at one of our campuses is a powerful moment. And so is taking communion at home with your family or by yourself. Each and every week when you watch service, I would encourage you to take communion at home to remember that the love that Jesus has for you and for me and the sacrifice that he made so that we may have life and life to the fullest. The bread that you take represents the broken body of Jesus so that we may have freedom. The juice represents the blood that Jesus gave so that we may find hope, peace, and forgiveness in our belief and faith is in Jesus. We created an article that you can go to that will give you direction on how to take communion, and you can find a link to it below. Well, right now, let's sing a couple more songs together. The first song is one of my favorites called Grateful. Here we go. That you have made Whatever comes I won't complain For all my hope Is in your name And now your joy Awaits my praise I give thanks For all you have done And I will sing Of your mercy And your love was down, you brought me out and set my feet on high ground. So here I stand, you are my God, your faithfulness my son and rock. Lift our hands. 